everybody. This week, we're starting off with the start of the Viking Age from 795 all the way to 386. And this week, we have special guest Denton from Denton's Viking... Denton's Tales of Viking Age. <laughs> and we also have Michael, as usual, from Clans and Dynasty. So guys, we start off with the start of the Viking Age. And not the Vendel Age, that is. <laughs> I like your uh, video from last week. <laughs> right, well, who wants, to, who wants to go first? I think you're the guest of honour, if you'd like to start off, and we can start like, the ball like rolling. The I like the sound of that, guest of honour. I am being paid for this, right? Anyway. <laughs> Just don't um, tell the guest from yes, last week. <laughs> Don't tell the lad from last week. My lips is the brown envelope. We'll make sure to edit this bit. <laughs> yeah, well, no, not, not brown envelope. That's so 70s. Electronic transfer is yeah, yeah, yeah. much, much better. Anyway, you know, the, the start of the Viking Age, which, of course, we would date 795, mm. when the annals of Ulster tell us they came along and they either clobbered Lambay Island or Rathlin Island. We're not really, not really sure which. But, uh, you know, one interesting thing I think about the Vikings in Ireland is the fact that they had a much more uh, considerable impact on Ireland than they did in England. Mm. Uh, for one thing, the, when the Dane law was established, all the towns and cities were there. Mm. I mean, the likes of um, Jorvik or, or York, as we call it today, was already there. It was a Saxon town. Whereas in Ireland, the... Well, I was going to say the Vikings, but more correctly, the Norse, because they weren't Vikings once they got out of a ship. Um, the Norse founded nearly all the principal towns of Ireland. When I mean, you have Dublin, Cork, Waterford, Wexford, you know, um, that was something they never did in England. And the Dane law ended about 954 AD when uh, Eric Bloodaxe was uh, chucked out of Northumbria. Yeah. But nearly 100 years later, there was still a Norse king uh, in Dublin because um, Cedric Olufsen died in, what, 10, 1042. Yep. So that's nearly 100 years later. You still had a Norse king in Dublin, whereas the Norse settlement in Britain had, had gone. Yep. And uh, a semi-Norse control remained in Dublin, a kind of Hiberno-Norse, uh, you could say, right up to 1169 when the Normans arrived. So, you know, the, the um, Norse period in Ireland had more of an impact on the country, and it lasted far longer than uh, what they did uh, over in England. Yeah, it's quite interesting, and I think one of the major people get uh, people do get really mixed up with is is the way that the Vikings do come in. As you say, they had an impact, but at the same time, it was mostly to the coastal areas in the yes. start of the Viking Age that we're covering right now. So when the Vikings do come in, they're going in to attack all the coastal areas. But anytime they go into the main center, the main middle of um, the of Ireland, they get mm. beaten up by both the Onakta down in the south and the Enail up in the north. Yes, yes. So the Irish would have had greater greater strength because there would have been more of them. Yeah. And the, the north did tend to stay around the coast, whereas in Britain, of course, they, they did go inland. Yeah, they um, did. Because mm. it's quite interesting, and this is the part that I find most interesting of all, is later on, because in the start of the Viking Age, you do have the impending approach of the Kingdom of Lucklin, which a lot of history books completely leave out. They talk about how the Vikings go in and they take on the coastal areas, but a lot mm. of history books completely forget that the men of Lucklin, uh, the men who've already taken over a good chunk of Scotland, are there at the very start of the Viking Age. And they're ready to jump over to the Kingdom of Lullid and have that famous battle um, right next to uh, Don Patrick, and that's that's mm. left out of a lot of information, which is quite interesting. Like, and that well, is a, a lot of a, a lot of things are left out in yeah. history, um, either left out or ignored or even the, seen incorrectly. And I mean, yeah. with the, with the Vikings of the, the Old Norse, there is so much misinformation, like horn helmets, but yeah. Yeah, of course, it's a war. <laughs> Or how brutal and dreadful they were. And they were no more brutal than anybody else. They just did it with more style. I mean, nobody else had nice ships with dragons on them to jump out of. Mm. But um, even this thing about Viking. Yeah. Um, when you have, I mean, I love that in the, the TV show, Vikings. Yeah. 
yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> in that show, actually, the comedy show, Norseman, is, is actually much more accurate and funny. Um, in that, the way they keep on, you're a Viking, be a Viking, remember you're a Viking. They never called themselves Vikings. Yeah. Nobody called them Vikings. Because, I mean, the, the Viking in, in Old Norse meant like a pirate or a seafarer. And, I mean, you could go Viking, but you couldn't be one. It's so, like, you know, you can drive a truck, but you can't be a truck. And once they got out of the ships, they were no longer Vikings. So the guys who raided, burned, pillaged, blah, blah, you know, yeah, they were Vikings. They come from a ship. But say the, the residents of Diffin or any of the other Viking towns, they were Norse settlers. They weren't Vikings. Even a lot of those who went inland and fought the Irish weren't actually Vikings. They were settlers fighting the Irish. Um, and, and like, I mean, to go back to the Vikings TV show, one thing they did get right, at least at the start, Lagatha and Ragnar are just farmers. And he only becomes a Viking when he gets in his ship and sails off to England. Yeah. But as soon as he comes back and gets out of the ship, well, he's a farmer again. He's, he, he's a Norwegian. His Vikingness is back in the boat, you know. And that's something that is always overlooked. They always refer to them as the Vikings. And, and you get this thing about the Vikings. Like they're one group of people coming from one place and they're all on the same side, which of course they weren't. They were coming from three different countries. They used to fight each other. There was a big battle in Dundalk Bay in the 850s between Norwegians and, and Danes. Um, and that, that, is, uh, that is a common misconception. Another one in Ireland is their, co their cooperation and collaboration with the native Irish. Yeah. Because, you know, you get this picture, Vikings, Irish, fighting each other. What you never hear about is when a Viking leader, or more correctly, probably a Norse leader at that, in that context, would side with an Irish chieftain to kick the shit out of another Irish chieftain that he was fighting with. And then that Irish chieftain would help the Norse guy to clobber some Norse uh, leader that he was fighting with. And there was a lot of cooperation. Like when when um, Ivar Ragnarsson, uh, better known, I suppose, as Ivar in Bainlaus here, or Ivar the Boneless, went over to lead the great heathen army, he made deals with Irish chieftains to keep an eye on the place mm -hmm. while he was away. But you, you don't hear about this, yeah. or even the trade, even before most of the settlements had become cities, mm. the Norse and the native Irish were trading. Yeah. You know, so this is something that's over. All you hear about is the fighting, them and this lot fighting each other. You never hear about this cooperation that yeah. was actually going on at the same time. You know? mm. I think another thing to look at is uh, the where we're getting the information from in the first place. And you mm. touched on it there with Lachlan, uh, uh, Philip. Now, mm. there's a problem with that. You know, well, I'll take it back one step further. Lamb Bay or Rathlin, mm. two, two islands described almost identical in the annals and stuff like that. Yes. Lachlan, some places describe it as Scotland, the yeah. Norse areas of Scotland. Otherwise, uh, other places describe it as Norway. You know, so the, it's, it's not just the fact that maybe we don't have the information. It's, it's maybe we have maybe too much information yeah. and we can't disseminate what is what. Yeah. And that well, way... The, the, you're right, yes. There's a lot of confusion on the information. And I mean, that applies to everything about the Old Norse, mm -hmm. the Viking Age, be it religion or anything. Because mm -hmm. so much of what we have, well, for one thing, most of it is not contemporary. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the sagas, all the, these were handed down by word of mouth, by skulls. And then you get someone like Snorri comes along a couple of hundred years later, does a Christian job on them, changes a lot of things. So there's very little that we have from the time. We, it's better in Ireland. I mean, we have like the, the Annals of Ulster yeah. and things like that. But so much about the Viking Age is conjecture. You have to kind of dig for it or compare it. Like, I mean, what, what, what did Evolver actually do? We know kind of what they did, but we don't know how they did it. So you have to look at uh, shamans in other countries and think, well, it's probably a bit like that. And this is very frustrating, I think. Um, well, you get something like, say, the 18 spell songs of Odin. Lovely, great. He tells you what they do, but he doesn't tell you what the words are. So you can't do them. He knew them. Great for him. You don't. And that is a big problem, I think, in dealing with everything Norse. I mean, mm. we could reconstruct a mass from the 11th century because we've got the script, it's all written down. But with, with everything from Scandinavia, you know, it, it's so hard often to get to the fact. And um, there is so much misinformation put, uh, put out about it. I mean, I, I've seen uh, school stuff and that here, where they have completely distorted history. I mean, for, for, for example, the noble Brian Boru, he drove 
the pagans from Ireland. He saved dear old Ireland from the evil pagans. He didn't want to jump to find a bloody pagan in Dublin at that time. They're nearly all bloody Christians. I mean, their king should be all of He was a Christian. He founded Christ Church Cathedral. You know, and Brian wasn't trying to drive any pagans out of anywhere. He simply wanted to grab Dublin. And you know, you get this this kind of thing, which is really not very not very accurate. And the the dreadful brutality of the Vikings, how they were the most savage people who ever existed anywhere. You know, which of course is very interesting because the people who wrote the accounts of them were priests and monks. Yeah. And where did priests and monks live? In monasteries. Mm. And what were the biggest targets of the Viking raiders? Monasteries. So, of course, you know, if, if somebody has just come in, stolen all your gold, burned down your monastery, you're not going to write a very fair account of them. You know, you're going to deem, and they were pagans to begin with, which meant they were servants of Satan, obviously. So, you know, um, you have very biased people writing the accounts. And I, I tried to make the point that, you know, that was a brutal age. There was no such thing as a nice raid. You want something somebody has. You know, it wasn't a matter of, could we please have all this and rape a few women? We go, oh, thanks very much. It's a pleasure raiding you. We'll be back next year. See you again. You know, that didn't happen. But when you compare Viking savagery with, say, a Roman legion, which would kill everything living, human or animal, in front of it until it was told to stop, the, the Crusaders, the Conquistadors, the Inquisition, you know, the Vikings never destroyed an entire city and slaughtered everyone just for the sake of it. You know, um, the, the brutality of the Crusaders like was way beyond anything that the Vikings ever did. But they're they're still labeled with this save the old Vikings, brutal, evil. They, they raped women and they burned things. And yeah, well, actually, so did everybody else at that time. Yeah. You know? They were they were only maybe doing it a bit better. And a lot of their brutality was very calculated because if you, I mean, well, Tamerlane, of course, did the same thing. If you slaughter a village. Well, the next village, having heard about that, is either going to give you what you want or run away. And that makes it easier for you. So there, there was a certain calculated thing in what they, what they did do. That, that's another one of the things I think. That well, we've touched on this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we've touched on this before um, about the different type of warfare in Ireland mm -hmm. to the Norse coming in. And at mm -hmm. that time, it was more cattle raids. There was almost a kind of um, ritualistic kind of uh battle going on there you know they had set sort of we come in you hide behind your walls we take your cattle then you eventually give us what we want and you you know we subjugate you kind of thing um and that's not everywhere because that's another thing that you we can talk about something and be like this happened here but it could be a totally different scenario happening in ulster could be totally mm -hmm. different happening in connacht um and uh We've sort of, talked, but we have touched on it. Me and Philip have touched on it before about the they were kind of savage to the Irish and the fact that they just didn't follow the rules. Mm. We get you know Brehan Law and and uh, the reading unspoken yeah. rules and the bit you know uh, they just they came actually, in and did their own thing. I and it was have a bit their own. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they have their own. Like because... um, the Finn Cycle in Irish and Scots Gaelic literature. This is the book yep. we're actually um, quoting from, oh. where the, the yes. Irish, who at the time were the Finn, the Finn war bands were doing mm. cattle raiding and stuff. But as you were saying there, they were brutal people. Um, Finn mm. McCool, we don't know if he was real or not, who was re sort of recorded in this period. He ambushes, he even ambushes women, decapitates their head as a bit yeah. of a, hey, you to another group, but, you know, I'm better than you kind of job. <laughs> I would be following my language, but we are being recorded. But you get the idea. <laughs> yes, yes, he, he was not very nice. Yeah, no, the, the original one. Um, a lot of people who watch this who haven't read the original literature will be like, ah, but isn't Finn McCool like the proper chivalrous kind of knight of Ireland and stuff? <laughs> That's a rewriting by priests in the um, 11th and 12th century. The original yes. Finn McCool that's actually in this literature that's written at the time of the Viking Age. He's not a nice man. He is a no. pure on brute, a very oh, yes. vicious brute. But as you were saying there, Michael, as well, and it does, it actually refers to them as the men of Lucklin in this one. And mm -hmm. the problem is, and this, this book highlights it, um, the literature actually highlighted it. The problem the men of Lucklin have isn't the fact that they're committing violence. They're committing violence, but they're not following the real right, you know? <laughs> that's literally where Michael's mm. getting the information from. Yep. Right here. So yes. that's actually... Yep. The, the, the information does actually exist. It's not that we're just trying to put two and two together. It's there set in stone. The monks are highlighting the fact that the men of Lublin mm. are actually having problems at the very start, simulating into Irish society. But as this mm. book hands out, 
they want to be a part of Irish society according to the literature because they want to be a part of the Ardria, as it says, the uh, King of Meads army. So they want to mm. follow the rules, but they quite they don't quite understand it at the very start, mm. which is exactly what yes. you're saying there, Michael. Yeah, of course. So yeah, and, and I mean, the Viking Raiders had their own set of things, where in say everyone else around that time was Christian. So when they were doing stuff, they tended they would avoid churches and monasteries and things. They stayed away from that. The Vikings, mm. of course, well, they had no respect for those things because to them it meant nothing. They weren't their gods. And I mean, they, they would have seen the Christian God as very weak. I mean, this guy wants you to turn the other cheek. I mean, Odin would bash your cheek kind of thing. Um, so they, they, and, but there, there's another thing. They are, it always, I don't see how many, many times I've seen it. The Vikings hated Christianity. Yeah. They wanted to wipe Christianity. No, they, did, they didn't actually give a damn what religion you were. They were very tolerant. A bit like the Romans. Like once you, you know, pay your taxes, tell Caesar he's a God, you can worship what you like. But, um, you know, they, they didn't really care what anyone's religion was, but all the money at that time, the gold, the silver, that was in the churches, it was in the monasteries. I mean, there were bishops who had more money than the, the uh, thanes or kings they served. So, of course, that's where the Vikings went. They weren't going there because they hated Christianity. If the Jews and the Muslims had had all the money, well, they would have ignored Christian churches, they would have attacked synagogues and mosques, and today we'd probably be saying, they hated Judaism and Islam, and they wanted to wipe it off the face of the map. And, you know, the the, the hatred of Christianity is a thing that often comes up, and you know, it isn't, like, yeah, some, some Norsemen would have disliked Christians, frequently because of the way Christians treated them. Because you have to remember, when the first Christian missionaries went to Scandinavia, they were either ignored, or they were politely told, we're not interested. Now, if pagans had ever sent missionaries, which of course they didn't, if they had arrived in a Christian country, well, their reception would have been very different. They probably would have been invited to a barbecue in the town square. The only thing is they would have been the barbecue. Um, so a lot of uh, Norse attitudes to the church and that, when they did do something nasty, quite a lot of it was because Christians were not exactly very nice to them. Um, that's something that is overlooked. You hear this hatred of Christianity, uh, I mean, would a burglar today burgle a dilapidated old house with broken windows and dirty curtains on the window when there's a lovely villa next door with a Ferrari and that's sitting outside? No, he's going to go to the... And that is exactly what they were doing. Their supposed hatred of Christianity is really not true. You know? And of course, monks and priests writing about them played up on that. Yeah. You know, that they have destroyed this and they've done that. And, oh, you know, like, like after the Lindisfarina raid where they, they destroyed this and the holy relics and all this the north didn't give a damn about their holy relics all they wanted was the money <laughs> <laughs> another, another one of those sort of misconceptions and well this is like you said we've touched on it there's so many misconceptions right from the just the terminology of viking um all the way to i mean uh, another one that uh i feel just needs to be mentioned here and uh is uh the islands of hebrides and you get some families and they'll say, oh, um, the McLeods were from Norse because the, the Vikings came and killed every single man on this island and took all the women there. That, does, that doesn't even make economical sense to kill every man on the island. You still need people to farm the area. You still need families to do. Uh, so come in, they don't come in and just slaughter everyone. No, yeah, they're going to kill. Good. Very good. Good point. If you kill everyone, where are you going to get your thralls from? Where are you going to get <laughs> yeah. the slaves? You know, I mean... Use yeah, and, well. yeah. Use yeah. I, I'm going to be sat here with a hundred wives because I've killed all their brothers and husbands and sons. And well, it could be fun, but, mind you, but well, <laughs> 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 but I, I, you know, the, but it doesn't it doesn't make econo even the economical because no. these these men, yes, they're they're right, they're raiding and stuff like that. But like you've touched her, it's money, and what makes money is the economy as well. You've got to make sure that you don't salt the earth at Carthage, you know, like Carthage, you, exactly. you've still got trading posts, you've got houses, you've got thralls, you've got even, not even thralls, you've got servants or just people, even people around you, commoners, mm -hmm. you know, will take over the nobility here, you know, um, but, and that's the thing that people forget as well, it's just looking at it with a, a common sense, like, that, that they still need the country to run once they've yeah. taken it. <laughs> well, I mean, like, you know, in, in the North Settlements in Ireland, they didn't exterminate every Irish person for 10 miles around kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, there were lots of Irish people who lived beside them. In fact, in, in Cork, there was actually a monastery right beside the Viking settlement. 
and they used to trade with the Norse. Oh, yeah. And I, I thought they, they must have been the only monks in Ireland who were quite happy to see one of these ships approaching on the horizon, you know, because they might have something nice from Frankia or whatever. But, um, yeah, and as you say, I mean, if you if you kill all the men, well, then who's going to do a lot of the work? You know, yeah. it, it, it would be completely ridiculous. But that, that is the kind of misconception that you do you do see all the time. And it is so, so ridiculous, really, I think, you know. Yeah. But that, that, is, that is that is seems to be the thing. Vikings equal violence, rape, you know, uh, and all this. But they always overlook. I mean, the the, the Norse uh, were the greatest traders, explorers, settlers of their day. They mean, when you think they went everywhere from Baghdad uh, to North America, yeah. you know, uh, they they settled all over the place. They they brought they brought culture. And, and exchange culture between themselves and other races. But all that trading and settling, I mean, you know, 200,000 Arab coins have been found in graves in Scandinavia. Mm. And that shows the extent of Norse uh, activity in, in the Mediterranean. Yeah. You know? and, and that is also overlooked. Uh, it, and in fact, the idea, every, people seem to think that every man from Norway, Sweden, and Denmark was a raider. I mean, a small percentage only of men would have gone raiding because, I mean, who was going to be the blacksmith? Who was going to be the carpenter? You know, there were jobs to be done at home. And the idea that every single Norseman went off in a ship and just left the women there to do everything. I mean, it's completely ridiculous. Uh, obviously, older men wouldn't have gone. Younger men wouldn't. And the number of people who would have made their living by raiding doing nothing else would have been very, very small. Most of them were part-time raiders. They were carpenters, fishermen, blacksmiths. They'd go off on a raid, get some loot, come back and go back to their trade. And that is something else that is overlooked. People seem to think every single Norseman went off in a ship with a nice dragon head on the front and sailed around looting and, and, and raiding. And of course, it's ridiculous. Hold on, what do you think was going on at home? You know, I mean, how, how do you get a new pair of shoes? How do you get your horse shod? How do you get the field plowed if everybody is in a boat somewhere a few hundred miles away? You know, it, it just, it doesn't make any sense. Oh, yeah. And you, you literally hit the hill, uh, nail on the head there with Cork, uh, exactly where I'm from myself. <laughs> <laughs> but on saying that, as we were said at the very start, there's the impending doom of the men of Lucknow up in the North Fern. But down in the very south, the Vikings are coming in, they're settling. They're settling in Dublin, they're settling in Waterford, they're settling in Cork. Cork, um, Vikings start to come in. We can literally see them in the literature starting to come in in 820. And they're mm. just settling. And it's very strange because when the Cork settlement is attacked, the, the St. Finbar's Church right next to them, right? So they're right next to each other like that. If you've ever seen, uh, being down to South Main Street, um, St. Finbar's Church Cathedral, and Viking settlement of South Main Street. They're literally right next to each other. The only thing that's mm. dividing the two of them is a river. That's it. They're really, mm. really next to each other. And when one is attacked, the other one is attacked. Like anytime you're going through the annals, and I went through it myself, went through all, every single time Cork popped up, and mm. every time Cork was raided, the Vikings were raided as well. So these St. Finbars and Viking Cork are just like this compared to up in the north, where you do see. Um, specifically families, the men of Lucklin, the Vikings, and you see the Ullid, you know, it, it, it's very, it can be somewhat black and white, you know, the way it is Viking mm -hmm. versus um, Gaelic. However, as time goes on, even in the north, that slowly breaks down. And I think the reason for that, perhaps, and maybe you guys will agree with me as well, is because the men of Lucklin are more unified compared to down in Cork where it's more kind of Gaelic clans fighting each other against, and the, these Gaelic clans are pretty much fighting uh, the men of Cashel, the um, Oonachta, who at mm. the time, Cork and the Oonachta were fighting each other. And that, that's the way they were looking at each other. Mm. So when the Vikings come in, the Vikings join the side of the men of Cork, and then they go over and they start fighting the men of Cashel, or the Oonachta, do you know? So mm. it, it, the Vikings, I yes. think the Vikings may have had more of opportunity very early on, to mix but as you can see even later on vikings were mixing everywhere later on you know it becomes oh, yes. way more mixed later on yes as, as they did elsewhere i mean the the way they integrated um i mean the Rus, oh yeah uh, uh, integrating there or in normandy mm. 
where it wasn't long before you know they were completely integrated yeah. and the, the, the fighting between the north themselves is usually overlooked like at the time the king of Dyfflin went down to limerick and burned all the king of limerick ships because he didn't like him you know <laughs> i mean and as i said the, the, a sea battle in dundalk bay between norwegians and, and danes and um, people overlook that you know as i said they, they see vikings as um i thought sort of, they see vikings as a group a nationality if you like you know this that does kind of annoy me where the term Viking becomes seen as a nationality yeah. when it's not, it's something you do, you know, and as I say, that is repeated in documentaries. And that's something that really pisses me off. I see documentaries that are supposedly factual and they get it wrong. They just stress the violence. There was one I was looking at recently but, uh, and it started off with these guys and they're slaughtering monks and I said, oh, here we go. And this is all it was about. You know, it was just savagery, savagery, savagery. No mention of trading settlement or anything like that. And trading settlement and so forth was actually far more important than the raiding. It would have been done by more people. Um, you know, raiding was a, it was done, but it was not the be all. Basically, the Norse were an agricultural society. They were farmers, they were fishermen. That's completely overlooked. Yeah, they raided part time, you know, but they didn't, they didn't, uh, as most documentaries seem to imply, they didn't spend you know, 365 days a year, 24-7, raiding things, you know. But well, uh, a there's a lot of misunderstanding. I think the massive problem uh, between documentary CC on the television, sometimes, don't get me wrong, like, and you guys will probably agree with me as well, there's a few documentaries and think, and it's the same with YouTube videos as well, and you think, wow, that person really did their research there. But hmm. Most of the time, it's depressing between you, bad YouTube videos and bad documentaries where they find the same source that people have been over killing a thousand times, the popular source mm -hmm. from back in the 1850s. Um, yeah. You know, Michael is probably sick of me when it comes down to Irish <laughs> medieval history. I literally, I, it's because I see it over and over again. They take from Gerald the Wales and the Romans when it comes down to Irish medieval history. And it's mm -hmm. the same with the Vikings. They literally take the same sources from the same monks and they yeah. use it a billion times over. And, the, the, these people doing the documentaries, they're probably not even seeing what the original source looks like. They're just copying yeah. the, the last um, history documentary or the last YouTube video that they've seen. And all right, how can I uh, watch this, uh, recycle it and reuse it for my profit? You know, <laughs> they're not even mm. reading from the main sources by the look of it. Yes, yes, there, there's an awful lot of, that. A lot, a lot of documentaries. I mean, when you get someone say, uh, like Jackson Crawford, yeah. who knows what he's talking about yeah. but you get so many of these woefully inaccurate things and not all and even like museums and that i mean um you go to dublinia here in dublin which is very good the recreation of it but again there are your little little figures with the horned helmets and there were all these things look could you not not do that in a museum you know it they, no. they, they didn't they didn't do that and um, costumes you know the you you see like as i say the horned helmets which of course we owe to richard wagner and during das nebel um they're so wrong you get i see shows where they get every you look at something like vikings they're all going around in sort of biker leather but i haven't seen a single woman in vikings who is wearing what i would call a correct costume i mean i didn't yeah. see one um underdress overdress the straps and the brooches nowhere you know which would have been the dress of a, of a well-to-do woman the men are always in ridiculous uh, costumes mm. and there's no and it's, it's just as easy to do it right as it is to do it wrong yeah. you know and the, you, you don't get this in other periods of history the, the 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 old norse suffer from it badly i mean you don't get guys landing on the normandy beach uh, on d-day wearing scarlet coats powdered wigs and carrying brown bears muskets but yeah. this is what they do with the Vikings, you know, they are so comp And when you see some of the movies, there was one there, was it Pathfinder or something? And even the ship had horns on it. Yeah. There's guys with these horned helmets, and there's a ship, and there's horns sticking out of the bow of the ship. Oh, for fuck's sake, you've got, you've got horns on a ship, you know? And this, this really annoys me. Yeah, it is. I think the thing is, you've got a, um, the, they're putting in there a wee artistic license, and I think uh -huh. it's for views more than, I, and you know, you, I am going to say you're a wee bit wrong when you say you don't see it in any other era. Cowboys and Indians. That's another era that gets completely, I would say, Hollywoodanized 
Um, uh, and as a matter of fact, you have hit a very interesting point there. It's something that I am quite interested in. I used to write for a magazine, actually, called The Little Big Horn Associates. And I have looked at Hollywood movies. And it, the, the United States Cavalry is something I'm quite interested in. And I have seen movies where they wear the wrong hats because they had a black hat that folded up. They wear the wrong uniforms. Uh, there were the, the suspenders, the insignia on the shirt, never had it. They wore a tunic. They have the wrong guns. You know, you'll see them with a Winchester rifle and an ordinary uh, uh, pistol, whereas they mm -hmm. had a, a seven inch Colt and the trapdoor Springfield carbine. You know, flags are wrong, uniforms are wrong, the forts are wrong. There were no Western forts with ramparts and towers and all that. You know, uh, oh. Fort Abraham Lincoln, where the Seventh Cavalry was based, was just loads of houses in it, quite open. You know. They get the cowboys and Indians so wrong. My, my great grandfather actually was out in the West. He met Sitting Bull and um, uh, quite a few other, uh, Cody as well. But it used to annoy him when he saw them go for your guns in the main. Said, Nobody did that. They weren't that damn stupid, you know. <laughs> he said, if, if the average cowboy from a movie had walked into a Western saloon, people would have said, Hell, the circus must be in town. Like, who are you? So, <laughs> it, it, is, it is completely I ridiculous. But the, the thing is, the reason why um, I bring that up is, and you've touched on it with um, the war, modern war films and stuff like that. And I won't go too far because we'll end up completely diverging off the main topic. But um, I think because things like uh, Braveheart and everyone criticizes that and uh, war films, uh, modern war, well, World War II, World War One, there's nationalistic arguments to it. People associate that. But there's no narcissistic argument to the Vikings yeah. because mm. no one can associate. You get families, you know, the Doyles, the McAuliffe's, stuff like that, who would right. say, I'm from Viking descent or I'm Galgas or stuff like that. But it doesn't really embody a country apart from Norway, Scandinavia, but mm. not the countries we're in. And I think because they hasn't got that sort of flag waving, you know, ugh, behind mm. it, it gets forgotten. It's like, it's almost like, yeah, if it's, if it's nonsense, it doesn't matter because it doesn't affect my identity. It doesn't affect anything to do with me. It's just ancient history and it looks boring, you know? <laughs> and I think that's, yeah. And I think, and it goes back to, uh, which another topic me and Philip have touched on, and it sort of embodies this channel is to get rid of that yeah. nationalistic yeah. identity sort of history. It's, it's, you know, tunnel vision. Like I only see that Brian Baru, we've touched on him, yeah. fought the, yeah. these invaders out of Ireland, you know? agree with you and I think trying to get rid of that sort of thing is important and but so many people I mean they go to they go to um, one of these things like the four movies and there are people who kind of I mean I've met people who seem to see the four movies as awful I mean, <laughs> Black Valkyrie and Medieval Armor I mean anyway or <laughs> hell with you know Atlas they seem to see this as well you know that's the way it was and that is so annoying, you know, and, and well, actually, you know, a good example of something that is totally wrong is hell, the goddess. You know, she's depicted as this half-dead creature, rotting on one side, maggots dripping out of her nose, a deformed monster, which was none of those things. That's completely made up. The only mention of her being slightly odd is maybe having a blue tint to her skin for, by Sonari. And from that has come all this artistic depiction of her as this evil hunchbacked hag lurking in an underground cavern, you know. And it's, it's completely made up. It doesn't exist anywhere. And there's so much of that. And it really does. I mean, generally, you know, they get the Romans right. They get you know, medieval knights more or less right. But once they, once they get around to anything to do with the, with the Vikings or the Old Norse and they start just... I, I, it, it really, it really annoys me. When, when you get something like a comedy show, like Norseman, I don't know whether you've seen that, the Norwegian uh, comedy yeah. show. It's better dressed than that, than the, than the serious ones, like Vikings. You know, it, it's actually worth watching. It's very funny. Uh, but they, they have it better dressed than the serious movies, which is something. But uh, hopefully, hopefully, you know, maybe these things will be sorted out eventually and people get it right. And especially here in Ireland, I, I think often we don't really uh, acknowledge quite the debt that we owe to the Norse. Because yeah. if there had never been a Norse occupation here, Ireland would be very different. We might not have some of the towns we have. Well, there yeah. might be different places. Um, and the, the Norse contribution to Ireland was greater than it was in England. 
uh, it had more effect, I think, yeah. because it was well, it was more localized. It wasn't spread out so much. Mm. Uh, and their founding of towns rather than just moving into existing ones, of yeah. course, that made a considerable difference. I think one of the biggest problems is definitely the way that people perceive the Vikings because mm. of media that dates back to um, 1850s. Yes. Um, the Welsh Viking on his YouTube channel, amazing YouTube channel, love to have that guy on. He um, did an amazing video covering um, the depiction of the Vikings and having the main problem of roots coming from the Victorian area from the 1850s and that the whole mm. idea of people running around in the black leather armor comes from that period and that we still have that depiction today. It is so bad that when the uh, representative from Denmark came over to Ireland, he came over to apologize for what the Vikings had done. Instead of turning around and referring to all the amazing connections and stuff that mm. the Irish and the Danish had done together, he came over and just apologized. And mm. it's quite funny because what he's apologizing for was actually what the Vikings would do much later on. But these weren't Danish Vikings. These were mm. Irish Vikings. And mm. that was the slave trade. The slave trade wasn't Danish Vikings. It wasn't Norse Vikings. The biggest trademark, slave trade market in Western Europe was actually Irish Vikings, Vikings that had yeah. already um, brought them. And I know some, uh, especially people who have never really touched on the Viking Age, but have the Viking Age idea from nationalism stuff, would be absolutely disgusted and outraged. These were the foreigners that, no, they were not born no. by the time they had really brought in the slave trade. They were full on <laughs> Irish. Um, Absolutely. They, it was only their great great grandfathers who were the likes of Ivor the Boneless. People, by the way, who most likely were probably kicked out of Norway to start with. Mm. Um, it was they were they were the grandsons of it. Yes, true. But their mothers, 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 mothers were all Irish. They were speaking Irish. Mm. They've been fostered into Irish homes, and they were playing. Mm. They grew up with Irish children. Um, a good chunk of their army at this stage were made up of Finn war bands, as we can see with um, the Ushuga. The Ushuga make a mention that they're the greatest traders in, our, uh, traitors in Ireland and all this stuff. But it, it's the fact they make a count of it that shows that how many um, Gaelic war bands were in, you know, levied into um, Viking Ireland at the time. Mm. And this was the biggest slave trade. So when yes. he came in and apologized, it's like, when you actually do the research, you're actually tilting your head and going, oh, wait, actually, we should be apologizing for you for taking the rap for so much violence and so much blame that the Vikings get. Because the biggest trade too. market, the big, biggest slave trade market wasn't in Norway. It wasn't in Denmark. And I'm not saying that didn't happen in those two countries. It did. But to mm. the scale, Ireland was full on committed to it. And mm. I think Ireland somehow is able to dodge and put the blame onto Denmark and Norway. Now, obviously, this happened 2,000 years ago, so I don't really mm. believe in an apology society for something that happened 2,000 years ago. Mm. But at the same time, it still was, they were Irish Vikings, the Ustmen, that were mm. doing this, not the Danish or the Norwegians who get the blame for all this yes. violence and stuff. So yes, it's yes. interesting and touching on that. Yeah, Dublin was the, the, the centre of the European slave yeah. trade. But, I mean, it was only getting going... I mean, you're, you're talking about the 860s and all this onwards. And uh, while the like of either the Bonus and all of the White would probably have been involved in it, um, I mean, that's crazy. Right, so you're talking now, you're like 80 years or so the Norse have been in Ireland, you know, and this is getting going. And Ireland actually was one of the last countries to stop uh, the slave trade. Yeah. Well, the church tried to, to stop it, but it kept going. And, um, yeah, that, that is uh, quite an interesting um, aspect. Uh, uh, and all the, the chains that have been found in Dublin, both uh, single collars and uh, mm. collars linked together. But uh, we're talking on everybody at that time, so you know. Mm. Now we're talking actually a subject here that sort of ties in both there, um, with Philip saying that mothers to mother to mother were the were, uh, Gales were Irish, and you saying about um, Dublin uh, that the Trinity Dublin Trinity College and stuff they've been doing recent DNA studying. And they find Viking burials. I, I don't know why they called them that. that and obviously Norse uh, yeah. burials with the swords and everything. But they would be right. typically what you did. And uh, these people are paternally uh, Irishmen, Gaels. Some of these. So it shows, and and that would probably be whether they because they were kind of fostering children. You know, uh, yeah. 
Viking song. Viking, I keep, I'm falling into that trap now. Um, Norse children were going into Irish families to be fostered and vice versa. So uh, by the time you do have this Norse scale identity, not all of these ha- you know, are Olaf's sons. Some of these are, you know, the Anachna children and O'Neill children. You know, these are pure, pure blooded Irish. I found the same in Iceland. There's quite a lot of Irish, like female DNA, which are now people say, oh, they were probably slaves, but I would say a lot of them were wives of women who just went with them. And I mean, the intermarriage began quite quickly. And I mean, you get someone like Friedrich Olafsson, Silkbeard. I mean, his father was a Norse nobleman, his mother was an Irish princess. Mm. And I mean, there was a lot of that going on. Yeah. So, I mean, his kids were, you know, what were they? Were they Irish or were they Norse kind of thing? Um, and that started quite early on because trade and yeah. intermarriage began quite quickly after the uh, invasion, once they had actually settled down and, yeah. and, and cities were beginning to develop. Mm. Yeah, so it's quite is. interesting because it, mm. I, I know we're covering the start of the Viking Age and everything, but it's important because in 820, when, as we touched on there, the Vikings come in and start settling Cork and in Waterford, Waterford mm. Vikings allied themselves with Daesha because they want to fight the Ushurka. Mm. You do straight away, that's what you're getting, is marriage mingled straight away happening mm. because they need to make allies because they want to fight that this other Gaelic clan. I was saying yes. the same thing when I was doing a tour around um, Denmark and stuff. Um, I was talking to various um, Danish people and stuff who were mad into Viking Age, and they said mm. when they were looking at it, they could see similarities between the Norse and the Gaelic clans. And that's why, mm. in their opinion, we simulated way better because we understood each other's way of thinking compared to later on when you the Normans come in and stuff and they're more unified and stuff and we're not understanding each other. But when the Norse, the Vikings come in, there's because it's more kind of this sort of tribal thinking, we start mm. to click in way better. We understood how each other's families work a wee yes. bit better. Yes, Obviously, that was, that was as mm. we were touching a bit on, it, it's not a hundred percent. Um Still, the Breton law seems to be a part a bit too complicated for some Norsemen, and it is complicated. Imagine the Norsemen came in; they didn't, ha- they weren't just handed a book, a book of rules and laws saying this is how things work exactly. here. And even like, like myself, you know, have looked at Fergus Kelly's. Like, if you're, where is it now? Ah, there he is. Mm. Um, Fergus Kelly's um, a guide to early Irish law. I, yeah. I've gone through that, and that's still very complicated. I still get yeah. tripped over most of the time from it. So you can imagine mm. how the Norse feel. They came in from Norway, no idea what's going on, and now they have a bunch of Fenians who are really annoyed at them, trying to decapitate them because they've been irritated and, you know, broken mm. their laws and stuff. And they're just like, oh, what the hell is going on? Like, I just wanted to trade or raid or, you know, join a local <laughs> army or something. You know? I think, too, the, the, the Norse would probably have been closer to the Irish and more likely to assimilate to begin with than the Normans yeah. because the Norman culture by that time well they were descendants of the Norse anyway but their culture by that time had become Frankish mm-hmm. uh, the Norse would have been nearer to the Irish in their general kind of behavior as they would have been to the English and I'm sure too very early on you would have been getting examples of well I want I want an alliance with that chieftain so here marry my daughter kind of thing yeah. now you're I mean, that would have, that was probably a lot of the early intermarriage where they were marrying somebody off because now you're my ally kind of uh, kind of thing. And well, yeah, that's, and that's, that's well, that's the thing. You try and you bring, because um, people would try and maybe people who watch this will say, well, surely the Saxons and the, the Danes and stuff would have similar because the language branch off the same tree. They're practically descendants of each other anyway. They came from, the, you know, a couple of hundred years apart. But the thing is, it's Ireland was a Christian nation, but it was it's in well, Celtic Christianity or so there were still roots there that were still yeah. very strong, like multiple marriages within a chieftain could have multiple wives. Same with the Norse and um, or multiple partners. I don't know on the Norse side if they would class their other partners in the same degree, but in Saxon law, you it's very. You know, you had your one wife and you're, you're the Christian. And so yes. um, forging those alliances would have been very harder, would have been a lot harder. If I am a chieftain and I have four wives and four daughters and I can branch out and yes. amalgamate a lot more families. No, yes. all, I could, you know, I could have a lot. And, and that there starts the foundation of these two cultures similarly and so much quicker. 
and so much better because all the families in one area can be related very very quickly. I yeah, don't forget, Irish, Irish Christianity was a bit different to Roman mm. Christianity because, as you touched on there, a lot of pagan stuff had sort of come into um, Christianity. You know, well, of course, Christianity itself was pretty much largely pagan anyway. But um, the, the Irish version of it, you could see underlying, there was still a lot of the old ways popping up in their attitudes uh, to things, which wouldn't have been the case with the Anglo-Saxons. Yeah. Because the Anglo-Saxons were purely Church of Rome, that was it. The Irish, there was still this bit of, you know, well, we, we, we worship Jesus and all that, but, you know, the old gods weren't so bad, kind of. There was quite a, a bit of that. I mean, look, look at the Holy Wells. I mean, mm-hmm. the Holy Wells of Ireland were pagan. It's yeah. just the Christians had started using them, you know, but nearly all the Holy Wells had started off as pagan wells, sacred groves, things like that. These things all came into um, Christianity, but they had started off as pagan. So uh, yeah. that probably would have also helped quite a bit, you know. Well, that's it, because it'd be ignorant of us, I think. I mean, we still hold some superstitions today. Um, um, well, probably my grandmother and stuff, you know, Irish superstitions that are purely you know, um, pagan. Um, the thing is, that back then, you would have had rural areas, yes, okay, they are Christian now, but they would have still been very, they still, those uh, pagan sort of uh, superstitions, as we call them now, would still be a lot more entrenched in their day-to-day lives. And the they, Norse would be able to relate to some of them, uh, many of them. And of course, it's, it's worth remembering too that the church deliberately used some pagan things to help converts. For example, I mean, they would build a church beside a pagan holy well, and you're using the water from it. Well, that that made people more accepting of it because it's their water, you know. They would build a church by a sacred grove. And, well, you got it with, with Bridget. They take yeah. an Irish goddess, they stick a halo on her head, bring her into the Christian faith. And her rituals, I mean, the, the everlasting flame tended by nuns. Well, in her worship in, in Celtic Ireland, there was an everlasting flame attended uh, by female druids so there was an awful lot of that brought in quite deliberately and the, the church did it elsewhere they did it in scandinavia too where they would kind of try to con- uh, get people to come into the christian faith by making it as similar to their own as they could do which was which was a sensible thing but it was done very extensively in ireland you know i'm going to sneak in own. with the uh, fin cycle again um yes <laughs> once again uh, the fin cycle and if you go through the literature again, the Irish monks are actually very anti-Irish war bands. And the reason for them being so anti-Irish war bands is because the Irish war bands still hold on to a lot of paganism. In fact, mm. they actually take part in little pagan rituals. One of the most famous ones of all, and we can all uh, remember to all days is when we used to pretend to be Celts and stuff, is the headhunting culture of the Finn war bands, the way they would collect mm. heads. This is not Christian. It's not Christian to go around collecting your best friend's head uh, around no. the corner. And mm. furthermore, and we can see this in the fin cycle, they would sit down afterwards next to a, bo- uh, a fire and they would put the heads next to them as if they were alive. This is very much a part of the shade, uh, shade the other world, you know, calling for mm. the uh, gods like the Morgan and stuff and talking about like the Finn warbands were still talking about people like Finn McCool. They were still talking about the Morgan. You know, mm. various stories like Cú Cullum is the most notorious and famous. That's what they would start the fire and tell these. An Osterman. Yes, <laughs> that's exactly. That's the type of um, thing they would do. Um, Ura and all the rest, right? While the heads were still there and they would pass food amongst each other, they would pass the drink along. But the heads, they would act like the heads were alive. These people to them were still alive. This is not a Christian idea. Like if you were, oh, once you got no. your head decapitated, you're off to heaven or hell. But to these people, these warriors were still alive. So they were pushing, like they have a fish going by and they take off a fish, bit of the fish and they push the fish, uh, fish into the uh, warrior's mouth like if he was still mm. alive to enjoy and feed. And there's a story where um, earlier on the day, this Finn war band had um, killed the king's, um, what's, just or whatever you know the uh, fellow that makes the jokes and stuff in the uh, royal court mm-hmm. they had cut his head off the finn warband had gotten sick of him and cut his head off and um 
he came alive. He was, uh, the lads are having a laugh and stuff. And he came alive and started uh, warning them that the King of Mead was going to get them back and stuff. And he, they got sick of him. So they grabbed his head and they chucked it away. But my main point is, is that they believed that these heads were alive. And this hmm. is not a Christian way of thinking. This is very no, pagan. No. And because of this, the monks did not like the Finn war bands and often would write them in until the 11th and 12th century when they would be Rom um, very much romanticized. Um, in that period itself, the monks did not like the Finn war band. And if you go through the literature, like going around collecting heads and raiding and looting, this is very much similar to the Vikings. So you can see mm. how, although they are different because they have more of that kind of background in Celtic culture, and now they're you know more Gaelic and so on and so forth, you can still see how they would fit in far better with the Viking raiders, you know, Finn. And there is even, although they don't call it going Viking, the Finn actually jump on boats and actually go off raiding, mm. which is literally it's very similar. Like, yeah. It's, it's yeah. them going Viking, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you can see why the Finn warbands, and especially like Finn warbands, how they work is that you hire them out. You, although they spent most of their time from the age of 14 to 25 before they inherited their father's lands, they spent most of the time in the, um, what's it called? Oh, <coughs> um, what's it called? The borderlands between two borders patrolling around there, bumping into other war bands and fighting amongst each other in this friendly rivalry, friendly rivalry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. A lot of times they could be hired out as well. And the people that would hire them were actually the Irish Vikings as well, the Eimer in particular, especially when they were going off to England, they would bring the Fenian war bands with them to fight in England. Um, Citric Eimer in 919, when he came over, he came over with Finn war bands and stuff. So straight away, you can see... Um, how the Vikings and stuff would mix in. I know very early on the period we're talking about 820 uh, from nine, uh, sorry, 795 to 836. And starting from 820, you can see Irish warlords are actually hiring Vikings in to go and fight, especially in mm. Cork, as we touched on. Yes. So hiring yes. Vikings to come and help them fight the Owen Octa and stuff. And you can see um, it's literally in the um, annals that the uh, men of Cashel come in then and siege Cork, you know, they, it literally refers to it like a castle or fort. And this is in South Main Street. And the reason for that is because the Vikings have now arrived and the Vikings are, are seen as finally a threat to the Onokta. So the Onokta are actually retaliating. But these Vikings are not just random war bands. They're under um, yeah. St. Finbar's Church, which shows that these people, even the fact that I, I just said it, St. Finbar's Church, these are monks. You know, monks are hiring Viking war bands to fight, yeah. you know, other Gaelic. That's well, that's something the Vikings did quite a bit. I mean, they were often available for hire. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have that the way they well, the, the, the first Rus were actually invited by the Slavs to come and restore order. So they were they went there by invite. You had the Varangian Guard in Constantinople, where the Vikings would, would go and be paid to to fight for someone, and. There is, in fact, I don't know if you ever read any of Bernard Cornwall's Saxon yeah. story. Uh, I mean, he does paint such a good picture, and he brings up this kind of thing where there's this lot who are fighting for somebody else and all that kind of thing. You know, um, he's uh, he's one of the few people who gets literature right. I mean, yeah. I must say, I, I like his uh, his so factually uh, correct. But yeah, there was there was an awful lot of that. Uh, well, we'll go and fight for you for money. You know, and, uh, that that was quite. Well, that's a that's the thing is what we're all uh, to touch on while we're all on this uh a Finbar's church and stuff and the the religion is we have to remember as well technically at the times um i believe it's like 797 the church in ireland is supporting dynasties and you've got columbus church and the patrician church patrick's church mm -hmm. the two branches of monks within those two um sort of in that sect or that uh, you know the christian and they're vying for power and they're fighting each other. And there you've got the, the, the Coleman dynasty and uh, Meath and uh, E. Neil in the north, both supported by these two branches of this church. And this is happening right as the Vikings are landing in the country and assimilating with their religion. And so they must have been looking at this going, well, you know, you've got two basically monks from each branch of this church going, join the religion. And well, this guy saying something a wee bit different to you, you know, which one's the right one? So I think, you know, that this is going on at the same time. 
Well, that can happen quite a lot. I mean, you did get cases where there would be bishops or archbishops who would be supporting this king and this bishop is supporting that one. Yeah. There was quite a lot of this where uh, the church were not all that united themselves. They were often quarreling among themselves. You know? yeah. Well, that's a thing we touched on before with the fact that a lot of church lands um, were held by clans of uh, the ruling dynasties in the area as well. Septs, you know, uh, younger branches and stuff would own these lands and would be the abbots and the monks and mm. within these very early on in that church, you know, because that's another them, thing. You know, a lot of them you'd get, it would be your brother or your cousin or your yeah. uncle would be the bishop or something. And he was only mm. bishop because basically you made him that. And of course, then yeah. he would support you. You know, that was very common. Yeah, and you know, uh, it's it, it went right up until I mean, uh, the uh, the example I like to use, and we seem to refer to him a lot as Brian Baru. Um, oh, no. when his family, the the McConsidine family, are a branch of um Brian Baru's uh, family of or the Dalkosh. So oh. and so it was happening and all the way up to the early uh, the middle medieval period as well. Um, these families would still stay connected to the church, but it was just the fact that there was two branches vying for that power at the time as the Vikings were coming in. So there was almost that internal struggle within the religion. And then obviously you had a new religion sort of coming back in, or should you say an old religion coming back in? Um, <laughs> but I just wanted to touch on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, like I said, it was just something that I felt while we were on the church is that we, we speak of the church as a unified Celtic insular church, whatever you want to call it, but it wasn't, yeah. and that's another thing that we have to bear in mind that they were trying to play. Um, what's the what's the what's the word kingmaker? No, yeah. you know that's that'd be the word. Well, the, the, the church all across Europe was very wasn't as yeah. united as people often think. They were yeah. supporting mm. different factions and one person trying to get power over another. They they were quite divided. Mm. The Irish actually seen themselves as part of a unified Christian world. A lot of people get very bogged down when they see the words like insular uh, Christianity and Celtic Christianity. Mm. They get very bogged down. They think this is a separate church. Um, mm. When in fact, when we're having these conversations, the reason why we were le- we you, the reason why we use words like insular Christianity and Celtic Christianity is because we're just talking about the conversation that's at hand, which is the differences between what was going on in Ireland and Rome. The mm. fact is, the common peasant who was on the field uh, doing his peasant stuff, uh, the serfs or whatever you want to refer to him as, he seen himself as Christian and as part of the Roman world. He didn't see mm. himself as caught off at all. I know the insular Christians in Ireland had their own little culture as in having multiple marriages, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. But the common man in the field, he didn't see himself divide. He, he, he thought oh, these no. cultures were yeah. exactly what they were doing in Rome. He didn't know they were doing anything different. And mm. we can see this in a letter from uh, Columbinus to Rome, where he Rome is writing to Ireland and saying, yo, what's going on? Why are you guys having multiple marriages? Why are you guys mm. doing this crazy stuff? And Columbinus writes back and saying, whoa, sorry. We, we we actually just had a different interpretation of the Bible. Sorry, uh, we didn't get the uh, text saying that there was an update or something. Especially with Easter, we didn't realize. You know, there seems to be a bit of a an argument on Easter and stuff. But we're actually still Christian. We're still actually, you, you know, yeah. we're we're not cut off from Rome. We're still a part of the uh, flow. Mm. So it's a I think that a lot of people get very bogged down, but. What's causing a lot of um, the fighting, and Columbus actually writes this in his letter, is the bishops. The bishops are acting like they are the Pope, and that's because the Pope isn't, you know, it's not like these days where you can see the modern news or we have text messages from people from there. A lot of people at the period didn't know what the person above, you know, beyond the hill was doing. So a lot of bishops in their own area were gods. And as so, not just in Ireland, but throughout Europe, you literally see bishops raising armies and fighting other bishops yeah. you know yeah. so Ar- ireland was no different now this makes history way more interesting to know that <laughs> in cork you know the bishop of cork was raising an army and going off into um cashel and fighting cashel and in retaliation quite, quite amazing um, actually yeah what happened to thou shalt not kill thou shalt not kill and <laughs> <you> need to <laughs> Well, it's quite interesting because we can see in the Battle of Hastings, they actually had a little mallet thing, you know, it says, I wasn't killing you, you know, I was only knocking you out. You, the fact you died afterwards from trauma, that was up to God, you know, it's just God really didn't like you that day, you know. 
Don't blame me, blame him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My weapon happened to, you know, donkey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the whole sort of Norse period in Ireland is quite fascinating, mm. you know, and the, the differences between it and in England, which are, are so considerable. Yeah. Really, mm -hmm. so, you know, you don't, you don't have that great Viking, uh, I mean, you'd have a lot of place names and things like that, like things ending in B or whatever. But the the actual direct influence on the development of the country, on life in the country, yeah. was far, far greater in Ireland yeah. than it ever was in England. It's, you know, it's probably, as I say, because England was already there. Yeah. The Vikings came in and lived there. It's, you know, it, it's, it would be different. It'd be like, you, you have a key to a house, you go in and live in it, fine. Well, if you have to build that house, mm. that's... That's different, you know. That that's what the the North did here with their with their cities and their long ports. Even yeah. where they didn't actually build a city, they still would have the long ports and, yeah. and all that. Because it's a different form. Um, there was a form of it's it's difficult. Like, would you call it city? Would you not call it city? But it was um, a large gathering area, such as in Clamacnoise, um, Cashel is another one. You know, mm -hmm. there were built up areas and stuff, but it's difficult to argue if they were cities or not. And scholars yeah. today, people who are far more like educated than myself in those fields, uh, they are arguing, is this a city or not a city? But if you look at what the Vikings built, they are definitely cities. You know, they're built up areas yes. where trade would come in and became center. You know, Dublin was the biggest one of the biggest centers for slave trade, um, mm -hmm. as disgusting, as disturbing as it is. It still was our main um, city hub in Ireland. Like yes, uh, yes. Murphy, I've Green. seen that. Uh, I've seen that discussion, and I know quite a lot of experts would say the Irish tended to live in villages, small settlements, where the Saxons had built quite considerable towns, like uh, like uh, uh, Yorick, uh, Chester. Though most of theirs tended to be Roman towns that they had, mm. uh, no, but they, they were still, they were there. Yeah. Um, Whereas the Irish tended to live in what we call villages, they were kind of scattered, and yeah. it was the North who first began to build a main street and houses and shops on it, that kind of thing, which would have been unknown in Ireland. I mean, you would have had your blacksmith, you would have had these, but actual proper shops, warehouses, jetties for ships, all that came in uh, with the North, you know, so yeah. their, their influence was considerable. Like, there's no arguing with the, the, the when the Vikings come in. The Vikings build a city. It, it, no, there's no scholars arguing oh, is, it, is it a city or is it not a city? But no. yet no. scholars are arguing is Clamac noise a city or not? Like, we do, what is the definition of a city? What is a city? What's not a city? And it really puts it up in the air, mm. the fact that we have to argue it. Um, when the Vikings come in, that doesn't happen. Um, yeah, it's clear, it's clear cut. This has this has streets. It has a palisade around it. It has, it, it is a, a, a proper town. It, yeah. it is a city. It's not just a collection of huts. Uh, yeah. Kind of thing. yeah, it's quite interesting. We start this um, discussion, as you say, the Vikings come in. They attack the main areas around the coastal areas, and with that, you you end up having a very negative view of the Vikings. However, the reality is. Is that it's not so cut and dry. Not every single Viking is attacking every single monastic area. In fact, as you've seen in Cork, they're settling in. But yes. if you still look, the literature that's still being pumped out that survived, maybe there was um, Cork, has to have been Cork literature. So it does question like what happened to the literature, the um, monastic settlement in Cork had written, where did it go? Just lost mm. in time. That's the sad news. Yeah. And the, ones and the raiding, the raiding of churches then died out. You know, I mean, the late Viking uh, era, even by the time of the, by the time of the, like of uh, Ivar the Bonus, there weren't the monasteries being burned and the nunneries attacked, and that that yeah. was because they were they were uh, integrating. So that was very much in the early the early stages. Yeah, uh, that's so interesting that you touch on that because one of the most famous ones, Armagh actually goes under the protection of the EEMR. You know, I know it's kind of like a protection racket in a way, but still, yeah. the Vikings are now protecting uh, monastic areas. And furthermore, when we go into the 10th century, they're building monastic spots, you know, which is yes. really interesting, you know? Yes, but where people see them as, as constantly, I'm sure if you said to a lot of people, they'd say, oh, they raided monasteries at that whole time. No, they didn't. They did that to begin with, but then yeah. that, that faded out and they began to... Uh, assimilate because the they might go into the hinterland maybe to grab a few slaves or something or to either fight with or assist an irish chieftain but you know they, they tended to live in their city i mean most of them 
they had families. They wanted to grow crops. They wanted to fish. They didn't want to be fighting people all over the place once they uh, had settled. You know, but everybody has this idea that Vikings constantly did nothing but fight. You know, that that's all. That's every every uh, every Norseman was a Viking. You know, and that is so completely uh, ridiculous. You know, and, and a lot of things also that are overlooked about them. I mean, they treated women better than most people of their time. Like women were not locked away as unclean during periods. They could own property. They could divorce their husband. He didn't treat me properly. I want to divorce him. They had a lot of rights and they are seen as these hairy, scruffy savages. They were the cleanest people in Europe. I mean, you had Lager Day, you had the bath day on Saturdays. They washed and combed their hair. They washed their hands and faces every day. They had a bath once a week. And I mean, you have this, was it John of Wallingford, who wrote after the St. Bryce's Day massacre that um, the, the um, Saxons, like they, they killed Vikings because, or Norse, they killed Norse people because the Norsemen were so clean and tidy. Yeah. Saxon women were leaving their husbands and going off with the Norsemen. About to say that as well, yeah. Of course, if the Saxons had washed a bit more, but you know, but <laughs> it just shows you. There's another misconception. You, I mean, how many movies have you seen them? Hairs everywhere, dirty. Scruff. Their hair would have been immaculate. They would have been tidy, neat. They were cleaner. I mean, the, the Saxons might have had a bath once a, once a year or twice if they were clean freaks. And it has been said <laughs> Saxons, the only time they would have been immersed in water was their baptism. Yeah. They wouldn't have been in water unless they fell into a river. But, um, you know, the, the, the Norse were much cleaner than anybody else. That's often overlooked. And I don't know how many even good documentaries I've seen where they're depicted as unwashed faces, hair everywhere. They would have been very neat and tidy, nice plaits, and, you know, um, which is another um, misconception that uh, they were these big, hairy, scruffy in individuals, you know. Um, well, how, how funny, again, it'd be something that's uh, written by the written by, written by the, uh, the church and stuff about these people um, but the, because they defiled their church. And yet, yet the Irish were also known to raid and burn down churches. In fact, a church 10 miles up the road from me, Grey Abbey, was burnt yeah. by the O'Neills, burnt down by the O'Neills, oh, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and, if, if those monks were kind of on the side of the guy he was fighting with, well, you know, it's yeah. tough. Yes. I mean, yeah. Irish, it's interesting yeah. because in 820, just as the Vikings are coming in, um, mm -hmm. Ian Ale and Jan Octor were not interested in the Vikings. When the Vikings came in, they're just like flies to them because anytime the Vikings come into the center, they're wiped out. What the Ian Ale and Jan Octor are more interested in is each other. They're in the middle of fighting each other, a massive war yeah. of unification. Um, the King of Munster is really pushing um, to unify Ireland, and he's using the excuse of these churches are dirty churches, they're all sinful churches, and as you touched there, Michael, he's burning the churches, you know, and he's not burning them, his justification is they're dirty churches, the money that's going into that church is dirty, so I'm going to burn yeah. it, and that's what he does, he goes, the King of Munster goes around Ireland burning as many churches as possible, as the on Octor are trying to tidy up and clean up, um, he, he literally goes on a war march around Connacht and Mead burning churches as he goes along, all in a, this justification of oh it's a dirty church. We all know from today, looking uh, behind, um, looking back, that he's he's just justifying it to unify Ireland under the uh, banner of Munster because when he goes up to Armagh, he crowns himself king. You know, well he doesn't purposely uh, crown himself, but he's the people who are propagandizing him. He, they're turning around and saying, oh, he's king of Ireland, you know? <laughs> so, as you said there, and Dr. Damien Bracton went back then and counted, uh, he went into the annals and he counted every single time the church is sacked during the Viking Age. And what he found was actually quite shocking. Although the Vikings went around the coast areas, burning the coast areas, because you have people like the Kings of Munster going around on a march, burning churches, or even the O'Neills were doing exactly the same, not the O'Neills, the Enails, we're doing the exact same thing, burning each other's rivals, um, churches and stuff. Clamac Noise is burned multiple times. Armagh is burned multiple times. In mm. fact, they're burned more from rival Gaelic clans than they are by the Vikings, who are just attacking mm. the coastal areas. Mm. Um, so when Damien Bracken was done, he found, he calculated the side, and he found that the Vikings were very low. The Gaelic kings were yeah. very high. They were really getting at it, trying to burn each other's um, churches and monastic settlements. That's fascinating, actually. That, that's a fascinating thing. Um, but you you never really hear about that. Yeah. And, you know, there's, there's quite an interesting story, I think, which shows how 
you know, the assimilation of them went quite early on. One of the earliest Viking um, long ports was at Anagassan. Mm. And when they left, they left one of their guys behind. He quite literally missed the boat. And he settled down in the village with the Irish. He was known as the bear. Apparently, he was recorded as being of huge stature, you know. But <clears throat> he stayed there. He mixed in, and apparently the local people were quite happy to let him. So there was a very, and this is early on. This is like, you know, 820. This is quite early. It was one of the first uh, long ports. So even at that stage, when these guys had just arrived, probably burnt something and stole a few things. Uh, and yet at the same time, the local Irish were quite happy for this guy to live among them. Obviously, he got on well with them, you know. Yeah. Um, so there's a very interesting thing from the beginning of the, the Norse Age in Ireland, where you had this um, friendship between the, the uh, Viking who's left behind. How he missed the boat, I don't know. He's probably drunk in <laughs> some woman's bed or something. And oh, yeah. came out and found the ship had gone. But um, yeah, so I mean, you, you even there, you have this very early example of assimilation and people sort of... Well, there's a written, there's a written example and the Macauliffs, which is a, a Norse name from Olaf, and they yes. are a sept or a branch of the Inokka. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a Viking, that is a Norse name to be considered a branch of what would have been is a very exclusive club. I don't know if any of you have ever looked at the branches of the Inokka and how they would uh, pick the king, the next king of Munster, within their ranks. They even had branches within their own family that were excluded from this very strict hierarchy. But to have a family that's clearly got a Norse name now, whether that's a maternal link or a paternal link, I, I don't know. But what I'm trying to say is that the, there's clearly a link there with Norse and to, to link into a family that consider themselves second to none, you know, especially the, when you look at the rivalry with the Neil. Um, so it just shows that there, it's even written that, you know, these families are, and this link is there, it's that there's no denying the link is there, that the, the assimilation is 100%. You know, oh, it, it wasn't as clear. That come from the Norse. I mean, you know, you Grimes, Boland, Rock, Crosby, uh, you know, I mean, there's dozens of names which actually come from the Norse, you know, oh. and obviously the, the native Irish didn't give themselves those names, you know, no. <laughs> but the uh, intermarriage thing. Yeah, but that's the saying. I am a, I, I am one of those examples. Doyle, um, uh, or Duhill, and which is dark foreigner or dark stranger, and uh, that's. But these, when I say my name, doesn't reach the the annals or isn't isn't mentioned. You know, I am just uh, in terms of Irish names. You find Doyles all over the place, but there's no chief. There's no you know. There's no royalty there. Um, well, there's a link to the King of Idrone, but I won't go into that one. But what I'm trying to say, but the Macaulay's, there is, there's a link, there's a, there's a definite link to the Inokta. Um, yeah. And for, I like, because, you know, MacGyver, stuff like that, these are all just, these are patronomic names that can be multiple sources, no real, yeah, they've made the marks in history, but there's no definitive lineage like yeah. the Macaulay's and the Inokta. Yeah. And that just shows that the, it just it always struck me as this Viking name, Norse name, could assimilate into something, into a group that I consider to see themselves as the pure blood high kings of Ireland, you know, yeah. um, to allow it to be assimilated into that sort of bloodline really shows how much influence these families, these Norse families did have and how powerful some of them actually eventually became mm. in Ireland. Oh, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Quite, quite, uh, quite fascinating, actually. You know, quite, <laughs> I, I find it quite a very interesting thing. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously very interested in sort of the, the broad spectrum of the old mm. Norse religion and history, whatever. But the, the Viking Age, so called, uh, I, I find extremely interesting. Yeah. And I do try, at least with my videos, to hopefully, you know, put forward what I think is the, the correct um, version, you know, of things, and maybe just spell a few. Dispel a few myths, yeah. which there are <laughs> so many. But, yeah. you know. but that's a career in itself, isn't it? <laughs> well, that, yes, that, that, that does tend to be. But and you know, somebody said to me, "Well, why do you care about like uh, media? You know, all of that. Why do you care about documentaries being wrong or movies being wrong or whatever?" And I said, "Well, because that is how incorrect things spread." 
and they take the horn helmet. Everybody thinks Vikings wore horn helmets. Where did that come from? The operatic stage, Wagner's, uh, principally Wagner's during Das Nibelung. Uh, because costume designers thought, oh, it'd be lovely. We'll have horns on the men, we'll have wings on the, on the women's helmets. Uh, so that misconception came from the theater. Now that was that was popular entertainment. So if the, if popular entertainment could have that effect on misconceptions, it just it, I thought well that makes my point. If you have things wrong in movies, in documentaries, in TV shows, you could very well be like Wagner's Bayreuth Theater. That's where the horned helmet came from. So you know that does show you that popular entertainment, which opera was of course then, can have a very very serious effect on people's concept. Uh, of reality, because I mean, the horned helmet has become, you know, I mean, you look at Hagar, the horrible cartoon scripts. I mean, every Viking cartoon or meme you see, really, they've got these these helmets, you know. And uh, th there was one there where they're all gathered on the seashore, and there's this fellow, and they said, like, here's Ivar or something. He's just come back from Texas, you know, he's a helmet, and these, these horns are about three feet long, stick it out each side, you know. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, there there is a woeful one of the worst misconceptions about the the old norse and it came from popular media so you know I, I think that is one good reason to try to get things try to get things right you know I mean, to say you wouldn't make a world war ii movie with the wrong uniforms or anything like that you would you would never dogfight in the battle of britain between a fokker triplane and a sop with camel so why can you not get the why can you not get the uh, the norse right you know but there you go maybe i'm just weird well, there are people. They're jealous. Don't mind. It's a re this, this has been a really interesting conversation tonight. Is my, uh, I thought so. Yes. <laughs> um, because the, the simple reason for is um, I was really expecting us to really focus on the raids. But as mm. you pointed out, and the moment you said Cork, I was like, whoa, light has come on. That's not that's the bigger picture here is actually yeah. it's true. We're having raids. And it's true that the men of Lucklin are up in the north and they're ready for a full-on invasion into Ireland. And we see that in the battle in Oled next to Don Patrick. However, uh, and as you pointed out, in Cork and around Waterford and area and stuff, it's a different story. The, Irish, mm. the Vikings are coming in and they're, they're starting to assimilate into the local culture and stuff. And you said, as um, the bear, um, I forget his yeah. word there. <laughs> yeah. The bear, anyway came in and instead of the locals turning around and says oh let's just skin him alive and eat him they actually started partying with the viking and stuff and he fit in perfect in society i yeah. assume he just married a local woman and his child got fostered in and stuff yeah mm. presumably yes yeah. yes it's mad, uh, and as i say like i mean when when uh Ivar the boneless arranges with several irish chieftains uh, will you mind different for me while i'm going over killing some saxons mm -hmm. you know and i mean that that had become sort of the norm by that time because they're probably saying well now listen we don't like we don't like chief paddy down the road there a bit so when you come back will you help us bash you oh no yeah. problem i'll have to cover him like you know, <laughs> it was sort of uh, very very so very common but you, you I, i've never seen any real mention of that yeah. you know it's all vikings irish you never say well there's vikings fighting irish to help the Irish, and there's Irish people helping the Vikings fight Vikings, you know. Um, it, paints, always a overlook. it paints a way better, much more cooler um, history. I'm um, living on the other side of the world right now, and I'm explaining to locals how history works. And I'm like, well, mm -hmm. when it comes down to when I'm in Japan and stuff, when it comes down to um, it, it's a bit like um, Japan, we've got clan on clan fighting, but we have, you know, Gaelic versus Gaelic fighting. But we also have Vikings, and they're like, "What? You're Vikings as well? Like Vikings come in and join your wars and stuff?" And I'm like, "Yeah." And it's so weird because a lot of Europeans and stuff, we look at Japanese history and think, "Oh, wow, Japanese history is amazing." And yet, I was explaining it to these Japanese people who were who are absolutely in love and very biased towards Japanese history because it's their own history, so on and so forth. But yeah. when I said Vikings, they were like, "What? Vikings came in?" settled yeah. and joined your wars and stuff and made it a thousand times more interesting i'm like yeah yeah they did actually you know, it's a <laughs> way more colorful be, and better picture I, the japanese ought to be um well able to understand the weird yeah. uh, situation in ireland with mm. different people like helping each other because when you go back in japanese history you go back to the time of the rise of the shoguns yeah. and the several hundred years where the samurai were fighting each other this warlord was fighting that war yeah. very much the same thing and 
this guy would say, well, will you help me fight that wall, yeah. and then I'll let you have this province. It was a very similar situation where people were changing sides quite yeah. uh, regularly, and, it's, and that went on for a couple of hundred years. Yeah, and it's so funny that we look at Ireland and we think, oh, Ireland is backwards because they have clan-on-clan warfare. In fact, Japan is doing <laughs> the exact same thing as well, and we don't frown upon them. And I always think that's very interesting. And well, So is Britain, actually. You know, I mean, I, but there's a thing I've noticed. They paint this picture that somehow... Uh, the British Isles were green and pleasant land, the sun, the sh- the sun was shining, birds were singing, there was no violence, there were no raids until the nasty Vikings came along. But when you think of it, I mean, the Saxons, Angles, Dukes, they arrived, they drove the real British people into Wales and Cornwall, and then petty uh, kings and thanes were fighting each other. Yeah. There was yeah. violence in Anglo-Saxon, they were raiding each other. The, the only new thing about the Viking raids was, well, they they were coming from somewhere else. But I mean, the Saxons were raiding each other and fighting. The, the only peace Britain uh, enjoyed was the Pax Romana. Well, the Romans were there, but once the Romans were gone, they, they, were, they were fighting each other. Uh, but you get this image that uh, Britain had been at peace until those nasty Vikings appeared. And the Vikings were only doing what the Saxons were doing too. And I mean, the, the Scots were coming down over the, the wall, the Welsh were raiding in, into Mercia. You know, there was raiding and fighting going on, but you always have this image of, well, it was only the Vikings who started raiding. And, you know, the, the, the Saxons, the Welsh, the Scots have been doing it for years. And on that and, note, oh, you want to say, No, I was just going to say, and that's even a generalised term of those large groups that actually uh, had multiple cultures and group, subgroups within them that were all yeah. doing their own thing as well. So we, we generalise the Anglo, uh, the Anglo-Saxons as one sort of culture. And when you had sort of, uh, you know, the Welsh uh, Britons of, in Cornwall and, and, and then Northumbria and uh, Cumbria even. So, yeah, and it, it go, if you go down another layer, there's still, there's all that in fighting. Go- so, yeah, it is. It's funny how beautiful, sunny British Isles, which is hilarious in the first line anyway, sunny <laughs> British Isles. But uh, and, uh, but then and then the Vikings come. So it is it is funny how we sort of focus on the history and we don't actually. If you just took one step back, you'd realise it was all nonsense. <laughs> and on that note, uh, conclude, lads. Yeah. yeah, this is way more colourful than I thought it would be. I, I assumed <laughs> at the start that we were going to be looking in at the very early. Now, obviously, I was completely aware of the later Viking Age, where the Vikings have assimilated, we have the Usman and stuff, but I assumed we would be focusing, because we're covering 795 to 836, we would be covering more of the Viking raids on Ireland, specifically on the coastal areas, and then when the Vikings come in, they basically, you know, the Vikings were wiped out by the Oanacta, and the Inail in the north, and the Inail and the Oanacta weren't really focusing on the Vikings, instead they were focusing on each other, um, that, that's what we'd be focused on. However, tonight we have done the complete opposite. We've actually focused on, although we did touch on the men of Lucklin and the Viking Raiders, we wanted to push the viewers' attention to the fact that, in fact, even at the start of the Viking Age, you have Vikings that are starting to, well, definitely want to assimilate into Irish society. Mm. The only problems yeah. they had was understanding the Brehan Law. That's the only wall that the Vikings actually had. Mm. But once they overcame that, as we've seen with our Boneless later on after the start of the Viking Age, the Vikings actually did understand um, Breton law, fostered their children and covered their own backs as they went over to England for the great heathen mm-hmm. army invasion. That, in fact, the reality is, is the picture is far more colorful and way more interesting than what the yeah. boring history books make out, where it's just the boring Vikings who come in and take over Ireland take over Ireland. Absolutely. That's like the, the, the black and white monochrome yeah. version. We did the technicolor version. Yes. <laughs> and then Brian <laughs> Brew and then Brian Brew comes in, unifies the country with a big harp flag and then says, Truck la and he takes over <laughs> Dublin, you know? The there, 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 is a, there is a pub near me called the Brian Brew uh, down in Fribsborough. And they have, I don't know if it's still there, but they used to have a big painting. Yeah. And here is Brian on a horse, which at his age he probably couldn't even have got on at that time. So yeah. <laughs> there he is, holding up a crucifix and oh. they leading the army to attack the, the pagans. You're thinking, he wouldn't even have been able to get up on the bloody horse. Yeah, it's mad like, because the reality is, 
is that it's far more complicated, way more interesting, and far more Irish, because the Irish aren't uh, naturally hateful of everybody that comes into the trade. We're actually really um, inviting. We like people of different backgrounds. We like yeah. having a good chat because we love having a good chat next to the fire. You know, that's what we <laughs> live for. And it's the real story is far more Irish than this hateful freaking unify each other together to destroy that group of people over there. It's not our history, you know, and mm -hmm. the real history is way more interesting because it's way more colorful. Now you have these war bands who are out for a laugh that's actually covered with people from different backgrounds, from Frisia, from Denmark, from, <coughs> from various places from around. Someone would even argue that some Saxons had made it over much more later on and actually, you know, took part in these war bands and stuff which leaves us with a far more colorful history than what we expected. Um, so to finally conclude, I think we had a pretty good, great chat tonight, lads. So. That was really, I, I hope yeah. viewers tonight who are watching this are far more open-minded than they were before. Um, if you love this kind of content, as Dalton had pointed out earlier, um, his main goal is to open your mind. I've watched some of his videos. In fact, his videos really pushed me forward when I started making my video channel. In fact, you were one of the first early people to leave me a comment, which really blew me away because I was like looking at your, yeah, I was looking at your page at the time and you had massive amount of numbers. And here I am with was like, what are two people and this massive YouTuber coming to me. And doing I was like, more wow. numbers, like doing more numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I've grown since. I think Michael recently completely exploded. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll uh, I'll definitely have to put some links on to and get you across there, like so. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, to conclude, if you want more of this stuff, obviously, obviously, guys, subscribe to myself. But go over to Dalton. Dalton's page. I'm going to put the link below into his. Uh, page. That's Denton. That's Denton. You're, Denton. Denton. You're, you're changing. You're changing the name. You're calling me Dalton. I'm Denton. So there. You, no. You've you've mixed Denton and Walter together. <laughs> I'm going. I'm going wild with the different names tonight. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I asked you to think. I'm even worried. I'll get the, the cash. Life. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll stop. I shouldn't have been let loose. I'm even worse in Japan. Someone will tell me their name, and I literally get tongue tied while I'm trying to say their name, and they're just looking at me, just going, "What is this guy? <laughs> like, where did he come from?" <laughs> so definitely subscribe to all of our channels and start to open your mind. Get away from the bad history books. Get to actual literature, the real stuff. Um, as I was saying to a friend the other day. No one is trying to hide history from you. You can get out there, get some good literature, get some good books, and really educate yourself. Everybody wants to get more involved with Irish medieval history. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, definitely. I know my page is Irish medieval history, but that my main point being is that to get away from the classic and the, oh, this classic idea that I really can't stand of the Vikings came and the Vikings were the precursor to 800 years of British rule. Get away from it. <laughs> You know, open your mind. Um, and with that, lads, thanks very much. All the thank best. You. And oh, thank goodbye. you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good night.